So we're midway through, um, thank you, sweetheart. We're midway through this Holy Spirit book, and we've really paused and done a bit of a deep dive on the fruit of the Spirit, and um, it really deeper than I had intended to, but once we got into it, it was just so rich. We, you know, we, we just have hovered here for a while. And um, so starting next week, we'll wrap that up today. Starting next week, we will begin studying the gifts of the Spirit, which is something that, uh, interestingly, everybody is curious about. You know, if you do a survey in any church at any time, and I, I just say this because I've been in churches, every, every church I've been in did this, hey, what, what, are, what are things you would like to learn about? What are some things you would like to have a small group on? There are two answers that always come up way above everything else. The book of Revelation and the gifts of the Spirit. People are just hungry for teaching on these things. So uh, next week we will, we will move into that section of the book and then we'll take some time like we have with the fruit of the Spirit to dig in deep, to get a really biblically based, grounded understanding of how these supernatural gifts uh, work and how they're meant to be deployed in the context of ministry in a New Testament church. So uh, today we're wrapping up Fruit of the Spirit. Uh, uh, I, I always like to re-emphasize as we go into these because when we talk about the Fruit of the Spirit, it's really easy um, for the enemy to introduce into you and into your thinking this sense of condemnation. You know, we, we talk about joy and peace and patience and kindness, and you can be sitting there going, gosh, I'm none of the above. I must not really know the Lord. Um, uh, so I, I want to I hasten to tell you this, that these are fruit, and fruit are grown. They grow organically over time. Uh, an orange tree doesn't wake up in the morning and go, gosh, I just have to produce oranges. I just, I'm a total fraud. Come on, come on, orange. No, it just exists, and the fruit comes to pass naturally. These teachings are to help us do a self-assessment. Where are we on this? And begin to, uh, to, to, begin to ask the Holy Spirit, because these are His fruit, to ask Him to, to more uh, specifically and uh, in a greater and greater way to grow this fruit in our lives. In a, in a way, it's very much like this. <clears throat> At Christmas, we cut down trees and we bring them inside and we, we wrap them in tinsel and we put lights on them and we hang bulbs on them. We make them as beautiful as they can be. But they're dying. They're dying. When you smell that beautiful pine smell in your house, that's the smell of a tree that's dying. Um, no, the tree that's alive is planted in the ground and it produces buds and it produces fruit and it's uh, beautiful in its own natural, organic way. And what we want to encourage you, what we, what we want to really stimulate you to do is to leave behind this notion of decorating some dead tree, of trying to hang on your life things that will make it look better, look more spiritual. Uh, that's not what we're about. What we want is to be, um, like Psalm 1 talks about, planted, rooted by rivers of living water and producing fruit that will endure in due season, right? We want you to be uh, uh, living trees in the garden of the Lord. This is, this is a, a fruit that's produced by life, not by law. It is the fruit of life, not the fruit of the law. And if your walk with Christ is in any regard about chewing the back of your hand or, or gritting your teeth, if, if you hear analogies about climbing up some muddy hill and, try, and you go, yes, that's me, then, then stop. Just go and slide down the hill, whatever. The, and let's start from where you really are. Let's get your roots driven deep in the ground. And I can guarantee you, that as you begin an authentic walk with the Lord, this fruit will be produced in you organically, right? All right, so up until today, uh, we have studied these fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Um, these are all uh, covered in Galatians. These all exist, by the way, in the first of the two verses, and the second verse are the two fruit that we'll be looking at tonight, and the first of those two is the fruit of gentleness, gentleness. Gentleness is a fruit that is both uh, misunderstood and dramatically undervalued in the life of the believer. 
Um, probably with every other fruit I've mentioned, there would be someone in the room who would say, yes, yes, I, I, I am praying for, or I have prayed for greater patience. I have prayed for, I crave to be more loving. Um, I could be more kind. It's very, very rare to find a believer who is praying, could I be more gentle? It's just an undervalued attribute, and I think it's undervalued because it's greatly misunderstood. Um, interestingly, there's a Greek word that, that is translated gentleness, but depending on the translation you read, it can also be translated meekness or humility, and in the NIV, the same word gets translated um, both as gentleness and humility, and for no particular reason. Just, you know, the translators in context uh, sort of choose what word they're going to use. But here's what it doesn't mean. It never means weak. Yeah, spiritual gentleness or meekness is not weakness. In fact, it's the opposite of that. Spiritual gentleness is strength that is restrained. It's a big stallion who can wear a saddle and take a bridle and stand still. That there's nothing about, about that, that stallion that looks weak or that projects weakness. He's just tame. He has been taught how to be restrained and gentle. And the picture here, especially with this coming at the end of the list, is that we, are, we, we want to produce, in the people whose lives we're investing in, we want to produce men and women who are big, strong, rippling, spiritual men and women who have a disposition of gentleness. It's great strength that doesn't express itself that way. It's, it's someone who has the capacity to assert or dominate and who doesn't. And when it comes to that, what, uh, what better picture do we have of that than Christ? You know, it's perfectly natural that the more proficient you become at something, the more confident you become. Right, when you start out, let's say that I'm starting out learning to uh, do macrame. <laughs> so in the early days, and I don't know why I picked macrame. I'm not even sure what it is, honestly. Is that where you glue macaroni to the... Okay, so whatever it is, I don't even know what it is. It just came off the top of my head. But so when you're starting out, you're just brimming with humility, right? If you're learning to, to golf or, or shoot pool or what, whatever it is, you're learning a new game. Gosh, you're just a babe in the woods, right? So teach me. I don't, I don't know anything. Nice and gentle. And then as you get good at it, you get confidence. And then, then as you get very good, the confidence starts to exude itself, right? And, and something like that can happen to us spiritually. As we mature, you start to think, okay, I get this. I understand this. And you can carry yourself in such a manner that other people find it off-putting. They find you unapproachable. And it's the fruit of gentleness that, that tamps that down and makes you approachable. It makes you um, accessible to people. It, uh, it, it's, it's gentleness when it chooses, um, instead of asserting its confidence, to adopt humility in, in the face of it. And who had more reason to be confident and assertive than Christ himself? Um, I, you know, I, I've often said, I, I just think really of all the miracles Jesus performed, the most stunning was his restraint. The things he didn't say. I mean, can you imagine having, having confined in, in the boundaries of your human mind and body all knowledge and wisdom, walking around the earth, having seen its creation from the beginning? Really? And then you see people just being petty and short-sighted. And, I mean, what, wouldn't it be the human tendency to be, to be like, come on, man, <laughs> to Joe Biden, come on, man. You know what I mean? It's, it, I mean, if anybody had the position to do that from, it would have been Christ. Uh, but, but look, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, here's, here's what he said. Come to me, 
all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He, he didn't say, hey, hey, suck it up, buttercup. That, that isn't what he said, right? I mean, in, in the... In the Old Testament, he's, you know, the Bible says of God, a bruised reed he will not throw away, a smoldering wick. If your light is dying down, you're struggling, you just, he, he would never snuff you out. In, instead, and it's really interesting, isn't it, that when Jesus goes to describe himself, right, he's talking, this is Jesus speaking of himself, he self-identifies as gentle. I mean, uh, his self-designation is not come to me because I am all-powerful. Come to me because I know everything. Come to me because I can solve all of your problems. No, the, the, the self-qualifier he asserts, the welcome mat he lays out to you and me is come to me because I'm gentle and humble of heart. So important, right? Because you and I will not approach somebody if we fear they will reject us. If we fear that they will judge us, look down on us. And I have news for you. The people in your life will not approach you if they're afraid you will reject them. If they're afraid that you will look down on them. Really, it's the fruit of gentleness that's the welcome mat in front of the gospel that you carry around. Look, Matthew 12, 18 through 21. Here is my servant who I have chosen, speaking of Jesus, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through victory. And in his name, the nations will put their hope. Isn't that something? The prophecy about our Savior says, hey, he's not going to come in with arguments. He's not going to be, or you won't hear him bellowing in the streets. He's not this big bombastic personality that's arguing with people and putting people. That's not who he is. He's coming with gentleness with humility, right? The scripture says it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. Let me show you one more. Isaiah and his prophecy about the Lord said this. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young what a remarkable descriptor of our Savior. And really, those are the attributes that allowed us to come to him in the first place. What an incredible thing, and what, what a worthy prayer. Lord, produce the fruit of your gentleness in me. In terms of Christians' truth claims, I think, and this is just uh, my opinion, I think there are two apologetics that stand out above all others. I think there are two testimonies to the authenticity of what we believe that are absolutely irrefutable. And if anybody will look at these two, they cannot resist the urge to claim that Christ is who he said he was. And they both reflect on this. The first is this, James 3, 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Um, the King James says, in the gentleness of wisdom. The gentleness of wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven 
is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What an incredible description of the wisdom that comes down from heaven. But consider this. Do you know who's writing this? Anyone? James, yes. And who was James? He was the brother of the Lord. Now let me ask you this. Anybody in here have a brother? Anyone? Great. Let me ask you this. What would you have to do to convince your brother that you were the only son of God? What would you have to do to so persuade your brother that he would... Now, and we know that earlier in his life, James did not believe it, but here we are post-resurrection, and he not just believes it, he's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he's writing this about the wisdom that comes from on high. There is no explanation for that other than Jesus was who he said he was. Listen, I don't mind telling you, I'm a great brother. I have no prayer of convincing my siblings that I am the sinless son of God. But James was convinced. Apologetic number two. Saul of Tarsus. Now, who was Saul of Tarsus? Well, he was a Pharisee. He was a zealot. And he was a persecutor of Christians. The early church was terrorized by Paul. He, as an occupation, was a man who slaughtered Christians and considered it to be a service to God. Scripture tells us he was standing at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr. Their coats were laid at his feet. He oversaw the first martyr, the first blood spilt by a follower of Christ was at his direction. And the church trembled at Saul of Tarsus. Then, just a few years later, he writes this. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, we cared for you. This is Saul the murderer. This is Saul the slaughterer of Christians. He's saying, I came and I cared for you like a nursemaid. I held you in my arms. In, uh, uh, verse 8. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. What in the world could account for a transition from Saul the murderer to Saul Christ follower, nursemaid to, to young believers? There is no natural explanation for that. It's only that Jesus is who he said he was. You've never seen a transition like this from anything else. L listen to his language in 1 Corinthians 4. We are fools for Christ. This is an extended passage, but you've got to hear it. Listen to this. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We, he's speaking of the leadership of the church, we are weak but you are strong, you are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsting, and we are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our hands, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. You hear this language of gentleness, right? 
even as you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you don't have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, listen to this, I became your father through the gospel. Uh, 20 years earlier, had he encountered them, he would have had their heads taken off. And now he says, through the gospel, I became your father. Listen to this gentle language. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I've sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love. I just, you know, my, I can't even wrap my mind around this coming from the pen of a man who terrorized people. I'm sending you my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And then he finishes by saying this, so what do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love with a gentle spirit? Unbelievable, incredible. Clearly, the fruit of gentleness is at full bloom in Paul's life. And listen, if he can grow this fruit, so can you. If Paul can grow this fruit, so can you. Be encouraged and rank yourself. We've been doing this with each of the fruits. When you look at the fruit, this fruit of the Spirit, when you do an honest self-assessment, how are you doing? How, on, a, on a 10 scale, where are you? Don't answer out loud. This is just for you. You just dot, jot it down in your book. Is, the, is the gentleness the grow zone for you? So for some of you, gentleness comes really easily. It's your natural disposition. Some people are just naturally, uh, they move in more gentleness and more humility. But be honest with yourself. It'll help you pray. And then as you disciple other people, help them to assess themselves. How are you doing on this? How is this coming along for you? And then finally, the fruit of self-control. Self-control is a dethroning of ourselves. We take ourselves off the throne we put Jesus on the throne where he belongs. We think of self-control when we think of areas of sin, things like temper or lust, or what, and certainly it does mean those things, but it really means any area where self is empowered, where self is in the center of the frame, where self has taken the spotlight. That's what we need to get under control because I'm telling you, uh, of all the enemies you have to deal with, there is none worse than yourself. Lord, turn me over to my enemies. Don't leave me alone. Don't leave me by myself, whatever you do. Um, here are some other areas. So I, th I think we, can, we could all go around and list the obvious ones, but here are some things that I think are not quite as obvious that, that bear analysis where self asserts itself and needs to come under the control of the Holy Spirit. Self-consciousness. Self-conscious. This parades itself, it disguises itself as shyness or uh, I'm just an introvert. So listen, I, I totally believe in teaching on temperaments. Some of you more naturally interact with people and some of you are naturally more bashful. And if you're naturally more bashful, you have to get over yourself. Maturity means that God's raising you up. I know this is a little harsh. Hang in here with me because I'm, I'm on your side. But maturity means he's helping you grow beyond your natural temperament. Your natural temperament, listen to me, will shipwreck you. When self is on the throne, it ends very, very poorly for you. And so self-consciousness, we, we give ourselves a lot of license. We give ourselves a pass. I don't have to talk to these people. I don't have to give my testimony. I don't have to pray out loud because I'm shy. I'm an inch. No, no, no. That is self-consciousness. And self has to be dethroned. How about self-pity? Self-pity dis disguises itself in the form of uh, grief, trauma from abuse or rejection. These are all things that have legitimate sources, 
but if indulged, will take over your life. And so, in gentleness and humility, the Holy Spirit beckons you out of self-obsession. Can I tell you something? There is something very seductive about a pity party. There's something that feels good about it. Entertaining the bitterness, uh, entertaining the loss, entertaining the grief, entertaining the pain. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you, you ever had a, like a bad bruise and it hurts, but it feels good to kind of rub it a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like that. And before you know it, you're caught in, in the whirlpool. And then you can't get out. That which hurts isn't dead yet. Mortify your flesh. You cannot afford the price that this will exact if you allow yourself to go down that wormhole. Self-pity. We've got to dethrone. Self-centeredness. This comes disguised as something you deserve. I've earned it. I'm entitled to this. This is what we tell ourselves when we're dabbling just a little bit with sin. Or, or uh, we say, you say to yourselves, uh, well, I've been single for so long. I know this isn't a right relationship, but I deserve something. I mean, he may not be Mr. Right, but he can be Mr. Right now. <laughs> Trademark, Gary Spell. <laughs> right? Um, these things come disguised, but all it is is the same thing. We're enthroning self, and the fruit of the Spirit urges us to exercise self-control, where we restrain ourselves and our natural impulses. All of these things put self on the throne. I heard a story recently of a bank robbery, and uh, this was so clever. I was sorry I hadn't thought of it myself. A guy... <laughs> I mean, I don't want to rob a bank, but it was very clever. The guy went into a bank, this is a few years ago, but he went into a bank at the end of the day and he went into the bathroom and stood on the toilet in the stall until everyone was gone and the bank was locked up. And then he went and opened the door and his friends came in and they stole a bunch of money and, and then eventually they got caught. But, um, but I, I, one thing stood out to me about the story they said, uh, and the thing they said, uh, the, the, when the investigators showed up, they could tell it was an inside job, right? That it, no one had broken in, that it, this had been perpetrated from the inside. And listen, uh, sin like this is an inside job. It's not something that attacks you from the outside. It, it's not, that this, this issue of self-control is chasing down the things that are going to going to devastate you from the inside out. Here's the way uh, Peter put it in 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, look, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits you. He says these, these little indulgences, these things that you allow, are, they're, they're the men inside the bank. Uh, when they first come in, they don't seem like such a big deal, but in the end, they, they will steal from you. They'll undermine you. He says these sinful desires are actually waging war against your soul. I want to remind you that this fruit, like all of the others, flows from life, not from law. This is not about you making a list of the things that you can't do or the things that you have to do. Um, I, I often picture it uh, like this. Uh, Paul described it as the perfect law of liberty, right? It's this, it's this path that we're called to walk, and, and this path is marked by freedom in Christ. We are free in Him. The problem with the law is it creates a ditch on either side of this road. When we start saying, I can't do this, I must not do that, I must do this, it creates a ditch. On the one side, if you, if you, if you are obedient, if you're successful at obeying the law, then it's pride and arrogance waiting for you on the other side. If you're unsuccessful, then it's condemnation and guilt 
on the other side. Nothing good comes from that approach. It is the law of liberty. It's walking down this road in freedom. True freedom is not a license to do as you please. It is the liberty to do what you ought. I'll say that again. That's a quotable quote. Freedom, true freedom, is not a license to do what you please. It's freedom to do what you ought. I look at it this way. I think for the young believer on issues like this, they think in terms of um, what will happen to me if I'm disobedient? If I disobey, what will God do to me? What will be the punishment? What will be the, and they can sort of govern their behavior in that way. But ultimately, that destroys, that erodes your relationship with the Lord because you can't approach someone that you don't see as gentle, as accepting. So ultimately, we have to transition and and flip the question around. The question is this. If you indulge that sinful impulse, not what will he do to you, what will that do to him? How will that impact your sense of intimacy with God? Your desire to sense his nearness, to walk in his calling on your life. It's such a higher ethic uh, you, some of you in school may have read uh, uh, the book, uh, The Odyssey. Did anyone read The Odyssey? Cassie, you read the cliff notes of The Odyssey, I assume? <laughs> <laughs> there were these creatures um, in The Odyssey called sirens. And sirens were half women, half bird. And what they would do is they would sing They had a beautiful song. And as sailors would come near, they would hear the song of the siren and they would be drawn in the direction and they would wreck their boats on the rocks and then the sirens would destroy them. And so in the story, does anyone remember what Odysseus did? He he stopped his ears with wax and he tied himself to the mast so he couldn't hear their song and and if he did, he couldn't pull himself away. And and I think that's the picture of the believer who's living under the law. You gotta gotta stop up your ears, you gotta gotta tie your hands, you gotta uh, bind bind yourself down. But later in the book, um, they're a group called the Argonauts and, and, uh, and their leader, a guy named Orpheus, comes up with a different plan for battling the sirens. No, no, No old literature majors here? Here's what he did. He put a harpist on deck to play music more beautiful than the song of the siren. And that's what we're called to. To to cultivate a relationship with the Lord that is so rich and so deep, it's just not worth the disruption it would cause to pursue something else. The song just doesn't have the appeal because I've, I've found something more beautiful, more enduringly satisfying than this temporary indulgence, whether it be sin or self-obsession or self-pity or self-consciousness or any of these self-things. I want to close uh, tonight and close this little section by reading this portion of Galatians chapter 5 that will put all of this in context together. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge your flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit 
and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. The King James says, for the spirit lusts against the flesh, and the lust the flesh lusts against the spirit. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, and by the way, this is all, listen, this is all by virtue of the Spirit. This is not you gritting it out and toughing it out. This is the Holy Spirit producing this in you. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Amen? Amen. Father, thanks for this evening. Thanks for this incredible teaching from your servant Paul. How deep, how rich it is. How you, Holy Spirit, are provoking us to growth uh, in you. And we pray that we would become people of the Spirit. And uh, Lord, I know that there are, there are there are places in the world where when you say uh, people of the Holy Spirit, it conjures up image of craziness and wildness and you know, Pentecostal extremes. But Lord, when we say we want to be people of the Spirit, we mean this first, that you're producing all these fruit in our lives, that, that we would be mature, complete, whole, uh, like Jesus, so that we can wield the gifts of the Spirit in a way that is effective that won't puff us up, that won't drag us away or, or leave us entranced by the miraculous. Um, so Holy Spirit, do that work in us. And I pray that more than anything else, Lord, the tapestry would be a church where the fruit of the Spirit are on display in, in resplendent fashion. That each one of these folks in front of me tonight and those who are listening, uh, by way of recording, Lord, that their limbs would hang low with the fruit of love, joy, and peace and all the other fruit, Lord, that bring glory to you. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Have a great night. Love you guys.